Well hello everyone and welcome to the United Church in Rill. Uh, as you can tell this is a little bit different this week. Unfortunately we've had a bit of a technical issue with one of our laptops and uh, it's having to go away and be repaired and it's the laptop that we use for all of our uh, film editing and recording and so unfortunately we're not able to record a service live in church but I have been able to reinstate the garden studio like we had uh, this time last year and it's great that we can still uh, worship together and reflect on God's word together um, albeit without any music unfortunately today but I'm going to share with you uh, some uh, Bible readings uh, a reflection from Susan Derber as we've been looking at in recent weeks and also um, some of my own thoughts so you're really very welcome uh, welcome to our midweek time of worship in Philippians chapter 4 we read rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we're able to worship together to reflect on your greatness and your goodness, to open our hearts to you and to give you our praise and thanks. Lord God, we rejoice in your goodness, in your love, the ways in which you have reached down into our lives and we give you praise and thanks. We thank you that you are an incredible God. And in the quiet now, we just open our hearts in and give thanks for the ways in which we have known you to touch our lives in, in precious and special and personal ways in these last days. And Lord God, above all, we want to give you thanks and praise for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. The forgiveness he has won for us upon the cross. The salvation that is ours through him the grace and the mercy that we know. And so fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Move by your Spirit now, that we might hear your word, be encouraged in our faith, strengthened in our commitment to Christ, that he might be glorified and honoured in all that we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, in recent weeks we've been looking at some of Jesus' parables during our midweek times of worship, and we're going to continue looking at such a parable today. In Matthew chapter 13, we read two really short parables that are often put together in our Bibles under one heading. The first is the parable of the treasure in a field, in which a man finds some treasure in a field, then he goes away and he sells everything he's got so that he can buy the field that's got the treasure in it. The second sounds a little similar to it, and it's the parable of the pearl. And I'm going to read that now for us, and it's in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 to 46. It's only short. It says, again, the kingdom of God is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Well, friends, also, as in previous weeks, I'm going to use one of Susan Derber's reflections from her wonderful book, Surprised by Grace, Parables and Prayers by Susan Derber. She writes this about the parable of the pearl that we've just heard. She says, it would be tempting to think that this parable is just a repeat of the one before it, the parable of the treasure. Someone finds something and then gives everything they have to get hold of it. But there are actually some important differences between them. The merchant is probably something like a wholesaler. He's not running the local jewellers, but is more likely the managing director of De Vere's. He spends his working life looking for pearls, trying to find the best ones. Of course, in our day, 
pearls signify something very particular. They go with twin sets, women of a certain age, and what used to be fashionable but isn't now. But in the ancient world, pearls were top of the league for precious and valuable things. Pearls were definitely a girl's best friend. And there were stories and legends aplenty about a quest for a pearl, or a pearl being guarded by a dragon until the right prince comes along. And the man in this story was searching for pearls. The Gospel of Thomas, a second century text that didn't make it into the New Testament and which has a slightly different version of this parable, says that the merchant was shrewd. He knew what he was looking for. And he absolutely knows the value of a pearl when he finds it. He's an expert in the field. But then the story takes a turn. Finding the most valuable pearl, he goes and sells everything he has so that he can possess it. Presumably that means he has not just the pearls, but everything. The shops, the houses, the yacht on the Mediterranean, the Mercedes and the racehorse. He sells everything. Is that so shrewd? What would he do next? Finding this pearl, it seems, is actually not only the pinnacle of his career, it's also the end of it. He has chosen a different life now, whether he'd thought it through or not. He's given up all the machinery of his old life for this one thing. He was into buying and selling, but now he's sold everything for one thing. So how is the kingdom of heaven like this? Perhaps the parable is telling us that the kingdom of God is not something to be possessed or got hold of like all the other things we have in our lives. It's not part of a lifestyle or something we can get into by doing or being the right thing. It's not part of a transaction that we can make. Be good and you get in. There was a rich young ruler who once asked Jesus how he could gain eternal life. What did he have to do? Well, this parable conveys something of what Jesus answered then. Life, real, eternal, grace-filled life is not another thing that you can add to the inventory of what you've bought. It costs everything and nothing. It puts all else of life into a different frame. It is priceless because some things cannot be bought that way. How ludicrous is the story of a shrewd pearl merchant who, in finding the best ever pearl, could only have it by giving up being a pearl merchant altogether. The pearl of great price, the pearl beyond price. That's what the kingdom of God is like, beyond our attempts to possess it, and astonishing enough when we find it, to make us worry no longer about possessing anything at all. That's another great reflection from Susan Derber on that, just that really short parable of the pearl. And I think the Apostle Paul picks up a similar theme in the letter that he writes to the Philippians. I'm going to read a little section now from Philippians chapter 3, starting halfway through verse 4 and going on to verse 12, where Paul says this, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the, the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, imagine, imagine you were running a business or helping to manage an organisation or a charity or, or a church even. Imagine that you'd had a really successful year. A business and trade had been really good if it were a business. Or it, as a charity or a church, you'd been around about lots and lots of work across so many different areas. It was all exciting and good to be involved in. It was really bubbling over. Work had grown and expanded. And you know you and everyone else is doing a great job. At the end of the year, all the paperwork is analysed by the treasurer or by the accountant. A few months later, you gather in eager anticipation to see just how wonderfully well the last year has been financially. Surely it must have been a boon. But you glance at the accounts and to your horror, every line in the accounts has a negative number next to it. And you scan right through the list of entries and there at the bottom, in big, bold, red writing, the bottom line is that it's all added up to a loss. When Paul takes a look back at his life before Christ, that's exactly what he sees. All that he believed was good and worked hard at, was passionate and excited about, it all adds up to a loss. Paul talks of his own natural heritage his own natural advantages, stuff that he had no control of, that really came about because of how he was born and where he was born and to whom he was born. Stuff that was good, privilege. His entrance into God's covenant family at birth by circumcision just a few days afterwards. Being born into the right nation, with the right ancestry, and with godly, zealous parents. And to this kind of natural heritage, he adds his own personal efforts. And he'd taken full advantage of his privileged position. He had trained and worked and studied hard to become a Pharisee. And as such, he had adopted the most respectful and strictest attitude towards religion and all of its rules. He was so adamantly right that he opposed others who said differently to further his cause. And he had been wonderfully successful. And through it all, knew that he was blameless by the high standards that he set for himself. But when his accountants and his eyes look down the page now, the sum total for all this privilege and effort as he has it, it's a loss. Verse 7, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Less than nothing for all of his efforts and no ground for confidence in God at all. But on the day that Paul writes the letter to the Philippians, yes, he looks back to his life before Christ, but then he compares it to his life on the day that he's writing after he's come to know Christ. And his life that day, he says instead of it, adding up to a loss. Instead, he sees Christ. Jesus is the hope, the confidence and assurance that Paul needed. Christ is what counts as gain and as profit. The pearl merchant had to stop being a merchant to own the greatest pearl. And the zealous law-abiding Pharisee who spent his life going after righteousness, had to stop being a Pharisee to possess righteousness, not of his own, but that which belonged 
to Christ. And so Paul sees the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Everything else is like rubbish, like the rubbish to be thrown away compared with what he gains through knowing Christ. So Paul presses on to gain Christ and to know more of him, to know more of his power and love in his life, even to suffer with Christ and then ultimately claim the eternal life for which Christ died for him. That is gain. This is confidence. This is hope. This is true. And this is right. Sometimes I think the preacher's job is to help us explore scripture and open up what God is saying to us today in, in new ways and help us to see what God might be, uh, might be speaking in this moment. At other times, I think my job is to help us remember the things that we really never should forget. And this is one of them. This is a reminder for us today so of something that we should never forget. And that is to know Christ. Don't trust in anything else. Don't trust in your church background, a whole life of Sunday mornings in church or Sunday evenings in church, this position or that position that you may have held, the fact that you were brought up in a Christian household, or the hard work and the fundraising and the support that you've given to the church over years and decades, the fact you were born in a Christian country, don't trust any of that, because like Paul, we may well discover that much of what we put our time and energy to, and that we place in our confidence in, adds up to nothing, or even less than nothing. But friends, instead, know Christ and the surpassing worth of knowing Christ in your life. Press on with him. Don't go and put your, your hope and your trust in anything else, but aim to gain Christ more and more and more. Have more faith, more knowledge of Christ, more hope in Christ, and know his righteousness taking root in your heart and life. Just as I was finishing preparing for these midweek services this week, I came across a quote of the great preacher Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher Spurgeon. And the quote just simply said, He who does not long to know more of Christ knows nothing of him yet. He who does not long to know more of Christ knows nothing of him yet. Well, I'd really encourage you over the next few year, few days is to pick up your Bible and to have a look at Philippians chapter 3 and those particular verses that Paul writes from verse 7 of that chapter onwards and make them your own. Speak them as if they are your own. Speak to yourself, preach to yourself these words. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I want to know Christ. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Well, let's pray together using the words of uh, Susan Derber's prayer in her book, Surprised by Grace, alongside this, this parable of the pearl. Loving God, I am here before you and I offer all that I am and all that I have to you. I need your help even to do this to let go of myself and to give everything into your hands. I do not want to be possessed by what I own, not even to be self-possessed, but to belong to you. Take me, God of all, and shape my life for good, so that in a world where ownership is all, I may live in a different way and witness to a different truth, the way of Christ and the truth of Christ. I give up all I am and own to be yours 
and only yours, completely possessed by your love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, I'm so pleased you've been able to join us for this time of worship. I, I know it's been a little bit different. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope and pray that God has been able to speak to you through his Holy Spirit and by his word uh, today. Let us go now with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. May he be with us all this day and always. Amen.